hello uh, thanks a lot for joining us for the second virtual seminar of ai and big data forum um, today we are very happy to have uh, laura welcome from columbia gsp and Ezra Oberfeld uh, from Princeton University to discuss uh, a, <clears throat> a <clears throat> growth model of the data economy. Uh, there will be 30 minutes for the presenter and 20 minutes for the discussion. And uh, then it's going to be followed by questions from the audience for 10 minutes. So please uh, send us your questions via the Q&A option. We will interrupt the speaker uh, once during the talk uh, with uh, clarifying questions, but questions that need a longer debate uh, will be in the final 10 minutes. Uh, moreover, uh, once the official recorded time of the seminar is over, we hope you're able to uh, stay online and join us for the informal follow up discussion. And now, Laura, the floor is yours. Would you uh, please share your slides? Absolutely. Okay. Does that look good? Great. Great. Thank you. So this is a uh, data on the aggregate economy, and this is joint work with Mario. There you go. So our, our main question, we're trying to understand and, and really build a framework to think about a more modern macroeconomy. So typical models of, of the macroeconomy would have capital combined with labor to produce physical goods, we might call them widgets, um, but a lot of what the economic activity that we see going on in, in developed economies like the US right now uh, is looks more like this, which, which comes from the, the cover of a recent Economist uh, volume, and it involves people uh, uh, collecting and processing data to produce knowledge. And so we want to get a better understanding of if this is what some of the most valuable firms in the economy are doing, how does an economy that has this as you know, data as inputs and knowledge as outputs, how is this working? So the top five, the top five most valuable U.S. companies are really data intensive, and this has really spawned a debate. Um, is this happening at the same time that there are new technologies for processing data and turning it into knowledge, like artificial intelligence and machine learning? And there's been an enormous amount of discussion about will this spawn a new data economy? So we want to approach this with sort of a skeptical eye and say, well, you know, what is new? And, and what about this might look old? You know, this is sort of old economics with, with new innovations and new words and new, new vocabulary, but the same forces at work. So let's start with the question, what is this technology, data technology revolution really about? So artificial intelligence and machine learning at their heart are prediction technologies. They are about predicting whether a particular observation belongs to set A or set B. And as such, we're going to focus on a model whose primary role for data is a role of prediction. It's not a role of innovation. It's not a role of human capital. It's about using data to make predictions. Now, that's not everything that data is used for, but it's an important use of data. It's one that's related to the new innovations to technology and therefore it will be the focus of this particular model. So we could also think about data-driven innovation, right? creating new ideas. But that's not really at its heart what the data revolution is about. That's not the essence of what machine learning and artificial intelligence are doing. They're really about prediction. So we want to focus on that prediction role and ask, can data accumulation alone sustain growth? So we're going to do an exercise that's kind of like Solo 1956, where we're going to hold innovation fixed and have an economy that accumulates data and see how far we can get with it. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the right model of the world, right? Obviously, data is used in research. We all have used data in our own research to develop new ideas and new knowledge about how the world works. But we think of that as a next step. And we want to start by saying, what can data accumulation itself do with the idea that data-driven innovation would, would then follow? That would be like the Romer model that would follow the solo model of the data economy. So the model is a recursive framework with data accumulation where transactions generate new data. Okay, so we're going to take a particular view of where data comes from. Again, this isn't the only place data comes from. Sometimes we go out and we do active experiments and we try to actively learn about new things. But a lot of the data that these firms, these very valuable firms in the US economy are accumulating is transactions data. It's who bought what when. So 
we're going to have this kind of data and it accumulates, but it's also going to depreciate because, well, the world evolves, right? So the kinds of things that people bought yesterday might not be the same kinds of things that people want to buy today. And so as the thing we're trying to, to predict changes, um, that will induce depreciation. So there will also be decreasing returns uh, in this model because we'll show that data cannot sustain growth without technological innovation. So one of the primary findings of this paper is that in many ways, data is kind of like capital, right? That the economics aren't all that new um, and that accumulating it is not the same as accumulating ideas. We still need technological progress. But we'll also find a force of increasing returns. When a firm is young and data poor, we'll see how firms can get larger and generate more data and get larger and so forth in a way where increasing returns is possible. And then I'll show you some applications. We'll talk about things like data poverty traps and entry barriers, data barter, the initial losses firms might make, and a force for specialization in either data creation or goods production. So without further ado, here's the model. There's a continuum of competitive firms I. So let me just stop here and say that this competitive firms assumption is going to help keep the model tractable, but I do think that uh, it's not my favorite assumption about the model, and I would hope to see that in future, in future work, us or others um, could, could relax this. And I'll show you why we might want to think about firms as, as being not perfectly competitive once we get to some of the results. Each firm uses KIT, so I for the firm, T for time, units of capital to produce KIT alpha units of good. So we're gonna have production with capital. But these goods are gonna have something we call quality. And quality will be A for firm I at time T. The firms will take the equilibrium price PT is given, that's what it means to be a perfectly competitive firm. And so their quality adjusted outputs are gonna be perfect substitutes. So this is a little bit of bad form here because I'm about to show you the equilibrium in the midst of the setup, but there's so little going on with the goods demand side of the, of the model that I'd like to just dispense with it now. So the equilibrium price here, P, is a parameter P bar, and then it's a decreasing in the aggregate supply. So YT is the aggregate supply or aggregate production of this good to the negative gamma means that the price goes down the more we produce. What does it mean to have aggregate supply? Well, it's the sum, or in this case, the integral, because we've got a continuum. So we're adding overall firm's I, and we're adding the quality times the number of units they produce, KT to the alpha. Okay, So quality adjusted units added overall firms, that's aggregate supply, price decreases in it. OK, so the key thing in this model is really this quality. And the quality of a good is going to depend on a chosen production technique, which we're going to call little AIT. And every firm has one optimal technique that's going to be called theta T plus epsilon AIT. So there are two components of it. Theta T is a piece you can learn about, and epsilon is a piece that is unlearnable. So the role of data is going to be to help you learn about what your optimal technique is, or at least this piece of it. So theta t is going to be an AR1 process. It's going to have a persistence parameter rho, and it's going to have an innovation to that AR1 process, eta t, which is normal, mean mu, variance sigma theta squared. The unlearnable component is normal, mean zero, and variance sigma a squared. So it's unlearnable, and it's also iid. So even if you could learn about it, it wouldn't help you forecast what's happening next period. So then the quality of a good simply depends on, there's this parameter a bar, minus the distance between your chosen technique, this little a is what you choose, and your optimal technique. So if the technique you choose is far away from your optimal, this squared distance will be large and your quality will be lower. So what you'd really like to do is bring your chosen technique, little a, as close as you can to that optimal technique, theta plus epsilon, and make this as close to zero as possible. Okay, so that's your goal in choosing technique. So how do we think about what this, this technique is? Well, you know, one way to think about it is that we're learning about properties of demand. You know, we're asking, uh, you know, do we like uh, purple shirts or blue shirts better today? Um, and if we produce the right color shirt, you know, maybe Svetlana's purple shirt is all the range right now. And if we can produce the right shade of purple, people are going to be willing to pay twice as much for it. And they're going to get twice as much of utility out of it because that's exactly the thing everybody wants. So they buy my like blue shirt, well, you know, they'll have a shirt, but it's not worth nearly as much, right? And so that would be an example of a, a technique, a, a, a production choice, right? Which color dye do we use that's going to create more quality or more value in a good? 
But another way of interpreting this is that maybe there are people who like light blue shirts and there are people who like purple shirts like Svetlana's and we have to target the right people. We have to get our goods into the hands of people who might really value them, right? And data is going to help us do that. So it's going to help us sell to the right people, get the right goods in the hands of the right people to create more value, right? That would be a sort of more advertising interpretation of what choosing the right technique would be. It might be directing your goods in the right direction. Okay, so in any case, you'd like to get this technique right. So at time t, the firm's gonna get some data points. The number of data points they get is nit. And these data points are gonna be signals about what tomorrow's theta is. Remember, theta is this learnable part of that optimal technique, okay? So data helps me figure out what's the right technique to use tomorrow. How many of these data points I get depends on how much I've produced. So KIT to the alpha is the number of units I've produced today. And then there's this parameter ZI. So this isn't essential, but it will be interesting later to think about goods that are uh, firms that are very good at extracting data from a given amount of production. You can think about the Amazons of the world and firms that are pretty bad at it, right? Like your corner drugstore. You might buy a lot of stuff there, but you know if a lot of their transactions are in cash or they just never keep track of who's buying what, um, they're gonna have a pretty low data savviness, so a pretty low ZI. Okay, so we could have firms that vary along this dimension. So data is a byproduct of production here, right? So you produce more, you get more data points, and you've got the ZI, which is like your data mining ability. So it's a, a parameter of the firm. Again, it's not essential to make the firm work, but it'll be interesting later on to think about what might happen if we've got firms that are good at that and firms that are bad at that. So each data point, we'll think of M as being a particular data point, which is one through N, N is your total number of data points, reveals a signal. And the signal is tomorrow's data, T plus one, that's your optimal technique. That's whether you wanna produce blue shirts or purple shirts or who you wanna direct them to. And there's gonna be some noise in this because we wouldn't want the signal to perfectly, each signal to perfectly reveal that state. So this is our signal noise and it's normal zero sigma epsilon squared. So the more data we get, the more information we get about what that optimal technique is tomorrow, the more information we get, the better we can predict what this optimal technique will be here and choose our technique to bring it closer to that optimal. So I want to stop here and point out that there's something that is referred to in this in the data literature on how firms use data is the data feedback loop and it's going on in this model. And the data feedback loop is that a firm that has more transactions or customers or is bigger tends to generate more data. And more data helps a firm produce with higher quality or efficiency. That's why they're collecting this data. And then higher quality or efficiency helps them attract more customers or do more transactions. And that's going on in this model here where you can see more production generates more data. More data is gonna allow this difference to be smaller which will produce more quality of goods, more quality of goods, well, that's gonna induce a firm to wanna to invest more. So they're gonna choose their K and they're gonna to wanna to choose a higher K if the quality of that goods, of that firm's goods is higher. So that's this data feedback loop going on in the model. So the last piece of the model is that there's a market for data. So Delta is the amount of data traded by firm I at time T. So if Delta is positive, this firm is purchasing data, but Delta could also be negative, in which case the firm is selling data. And at each date, a firm could buy or could sell, but we're not gonna allow it to do both at the same date, okay? So there's a data price, Pi T, that clears the data market, it equates total demand and total supply. And data has the potential here to be not perfectly rival. So it could be multi-use. Right? That's one of the features of data is that you can use a data set, your co-author can use the same data set at the same time, and you don't interfere with each other. That's non-rivalry. So if you could sell it and you can still use it, it raises this question of why isn't all data sold? Right? In this perfectly competitive market where nothing I do affects the market price, why wouldn't I sell all the data I have? Well, there's got to be some cost or regulation to generate some interior solution to this problem. So we're going to deal with that by saying, if you sell some of your data, you lose a fraction of it. And iota is the fraction of the sold data that's lost. 
Now, this could be privacy restrictions. It could be illegal for you to sell all your data and use all of it too. Or it could be, and this is where I get back to, you might want to think about moving away from perfect competition. It could be that there's some market power here. That if I sell a whole bunch of my data to my competitors, that I'm going to be less competitive in this market going forward because they're going to be um, producing more efficiently. But we're going to build this in as you lose some of that data. And then finally, there's a data adjustment cost. And we do this for exactly the same reason that the, the literature on firm dynamics with capital accumulation has adjustment costs, which is to avoid one period convergence. Okay, so this paper is mainly about a tool and the tool is how can we express this growth economy in a simple and tractable way? So the key to doing this is choosing the right state variable. We call that state variable stock of knowledge. It's labeled omega and it's, this expression here. So let me start by interpreting it. Your expectation of theta, that's your forecast of what you think the best technique will be. Remember the epsilon you can't learn anything about and it's mean zero. So this is your best guess of what technique A you'd like to choose. And the difference between your forecast and the realization, this is a forecast error. So this is a squared forecast error. And this is your expected squared forecast error. So that's what we call a conditional variance. And when we invert that, the inverse of a variance is a precision. So this thing is a conditional precision or conditional or posterior precision in Bayesian terms. So it's about how precise your forecast is of this moving variable theta that represents your optimal technique. And that stock of knowledge is useful because if we take the first order condition for your optimal technique choice and we substitute in that your best thing to do, your best little A to choose is gonna be your best guess of what Mars theta is, we get that the expected quality of your goods is a parameter A bar minus omega inverse, that's your stock of knowledge inverse, minus that unlearnable component of the uh, optimal technique, the variance of that sigma A squared. Okay, so now we can express your expected quality as a function of that state variable. So, that means we can express this as a recursive problem, just like we would express a very simple growth model with capital accumulation, where the optimal sequence of capital investment choices solves this recursive problem. The value of this stock of knowledge, omega IT, is, your, is the maximum. So you're gonna choose capital. You're gonna choose data to buy or sell. This is your gross revenue. It's your price times, that's your expected quality. That's this expression up here times the number of units you produce. So you get this in gross revenue. There's your data adjustment cost. It depends on how much you change your stock of knowledge. There's what you've paid if you've purchased data. This will be negative, so minus, minus. It'll be positive source of revenue if you've sold data. There's your capital rental. And here's your discounted value of next period's stock of knowledge. And then the number of data points you get, as we said before, is your data savviness times the number of units you produce. And here's how you update that stock of knowledge. So tomorrow's stock of knowledge will depend on a discounted yes, uh, yesterday's knowledge. So whatever you knew yesterday, and we're gonna have to discount that, plus the new inflows of data into that stock. So let me start with how you discount. So yesterday, Omega IT was your stock of knowledge. You got one additional data point, which has precision sigma A negative two. And what that data point is, is what your quality was. So from seeing your own quality, you can infer what the square difference is. You can infer what theta plus epsilon was. You can't see exactly theta. And so this is a noisy signal about theta with variant sigma A squared. So this is what you know at the end of time t. Now you discount it for two reasons. One is, according to the persistence of the state process. If that state is very persistent, if rho is near one, that means the data yesterday is really relevant for today because your state yesterday and today has a lot in common. So you don't discount too much, but if that state is not very persistent, you got to discount a lot. Similarly, this is the variance of the innovation to the error one process. If that error one process has big innovations, then yesterday's state and today's state could be quite different. And so data from yesterday is less relevant for today. So you're gonna discount more. So this is your discounted stock of knowledge. This is the new data inflows, that second term. This is the number of data points you produce. This is the data you purchase or sell. 
whether you uh, buy or sell is a little different because remember, if you sell the data, you get to keep a fraction, you lose a fraction iota of it. And this is the precision of each of these data points. So this is like discounted capital stock from yesterday. And this is like new investments, except now it's for data. So just to be clear about what this represents, omega here is like the discounted sum of investments in data, I explained to you how we discount, and then we add in these new data points. V of omega should be the firm's value of data, or V of omega minus V of zero is how much more valuable this firm is because of the data that it owns. And V prime of omega represents the marginal value of a unit of data. So one could take this framework, similar to how we use aggregate macro frameworks, and try to quantify these things to figure out how much does data add to the value of the firm and what price should they be willing to pay for it. So in what comes next, I'm going to do three things. I'm going to talk about the source of diminishing returns, the source of increasing returns, and I'll mention briefly a few applications of this tools to think about markets of data, data poverty traps, data barter, and specialization in data sales. But before I go on to the results, I want to stop and ask whether there are any clarifying questions in the chat. Um, I think you've been super clear, Laura, so uh, you should uh, continue. Okay, great. Okay, so I've got uh, 10 minutes left. Just want to check that. Great. Okay. So the first result is the uh, long run diminishing returns to date. So anybody who's ever taught an intro macro course has probably seen a version of this graph and you used it to teach the solo model. Um, and we taught that this is the inflows of capital and these are the outflows of capital. When the inflows exceed the outflows, this economy is accumulating more capital and it's growing. Well, this is actually the same thing, but we've plotted it in our model for data. So the inflows of data are the number of units you produce because that's related to how many data points you get how uh, data savvy you are, how good you are at translating number of units produced into signals, and the precision of each one of those data points. So that's the total precision that you add to your stock of data each period. Your outflow is data depreciation. So that's basically the difference between omega t plus one and omega t if you hadn't added anything to your stock. How much did you lose because the state is changing, because it's not perfectly persistent and there are innovations in the ARO1 process. So that thing's not perfectly linear, right? What I showed you wasn't a linear function. It turns out it's close to linear. We prove that it's arbitrarily close to linear in certain parameter ranges. So in steady state, you know, what happens with this economy is while well, inflows are greater than outflows, it's accumulating more data, it's accumulating more data, and it's accumulating a little less and a little less and a little less until it gets to steady state. And steady state is where growth stops. So just like the solo model with capital accumulation, this is going to be a model where there are limits to how rich you can get through data accumulation. Now, how specific is there to, to our modeling assumptions? The answer is incredibly dependent and not dependent. So let me first show you why this is super fragile. Okay, so right here, we said there's a maximum possible quality that you can get to each good. That's a bar. And no matter how much data you, can, you get, the best you can ever do is get A equal to theta, right? That would be an infinite amount of data with perfect predictability. And that's going to get you finite gains in quality. So in that sense, they're sort of hardwired and diminishing returns in this model. But in another sense, this is really general. So why do I say that? Well, let's step back from this particular model and think about what if we wrote down a model for data-driven growth as sustainable without any innovation? Okay, so let's suppose we had a model where that quality could become infinite. Okay, so consider an arbitrary model where data is used to forecast and those forecasts affect the value of the output. Okay, and we're going to say growth is sustainable if the growth rate of this economy at every date t is greater than a positive lower bound. So we don't mean asymptoting to zero, but always growing a little bit. We mean like it sustains a strictly positive rate of growth. Um, that's greater than a lower bound G lower bar. So that can be sustained only if two things are true. The first is we would need for perfect forecasts to generate infinite output, right? Because if that's not true and data is used for forecasting, then we'll get infinite data, we'll get perfect forecasts, but we'll only get finite output, right? That's like the case in this model. So you'd need for any finite valued mapping 
between data and uh, and out or for between uh, forca forecast precision and output for perfect forecast to generate infinite output. And we've got lots of models where you know what's going to happen one period in advance, and I've yet to see any that give us infinite output. So that's not consistent with most of the models that economists write down, but you can form your own judgment about what you think about that. But you'd also need a second uh, proposition. You'd need a second uh, feature of your model to be true, which is you need for the future to be deterministic. So if the, the future would have to be perfectly deterministic, meaning that there would have to be a deterministic mapping between observable things today and the relevant state of the world tomorrow that you're trying to forecast. Because if there isn't a deterministic mapping between those two things, then it means everything that's learnable today can't perfectly forecast tomorrow. And if you can't perfectly forecast tomorrow, you can't possibly get to these perfect forecasts that generate you infinite output. Okay, So you'd need for perfect forecast to get you infinite output, and you need for perfect forecast to be possible. And while that sounds not so restrictive, it basically means that the future has got to be at least one period ahead, perfectly deterministic. And that's a little odd. But again, you know, whether that's true or not is probably uh, the realm of, of um, philosophy and uh, above my pay grade. But those were features that you'd need to have that are not typical of most economic models. And Laura, okay. you have five more minutes. Great. So this is, um, this is just kind of what that process looks like. This is what diminishing returns looks like. We're, we're maxing out at a particular level of output as the price comes down. Um, and this is what happens when they're homogenous firms. So they're growing and accumulating data together. But now let me show you what happens when there's a single firm that enters and all the other firms of the economy are in steady state. Something quite different happens, which is you can get increasing returns. You can get a convex data flow. And why is this happening? What's well, happening because of that data feedback loop I showed you. This firm's really small, so it doesn't generate much data. And data adjustment's kind of expensive, and buying data is kind of expensive, and so it accumulates data kind of slowly. And because it accumulates data slowly, it grows slowly. But as it gets bigger, it generates more data, it buys more data, right? This, this gray area is the difference between the data it produces and what it uses, so that's how much it buys, and it starts growing faster. But these convexity regions are important because they could mean that you could kind of get stuck, not stuck literally and you'd never grow out of it, but you could spend a lot of time getting out of this slow growth region. And it could generate a lot of diversity, a lot of heterogeneity in the experiences of firms that start this trajectory earlier or later. So another feature of this model that arises is data barter. So let's say, let's clarify, what do we mean by barter? Well, barter means that data is exchanged for something, right? And so what is it being exchanged for? Um, well, it's your, there are firms that will sell goods in this model at a price of zero, right? And actually, this happens a lot in reality. My guess is if you take your smartphone that probably is sitting right next to you and you pick it up, you probably have an app on there that you've paid a price of zero for, right? You never paid a penny for it, but you do pay for it. Why do you pay for it? Well, because that app collects data on your activities. And so you're basically exchanging the digital service represented by what you get from that app, the, the, you know, the use you get out of that app for your data flow. And that's happening in this model as well. Firms are selling goods at price zero, but they're willing to do that because they're getting their customers data, right? So they're basically bartering the goods for data. And this happens because that increases their value with their data stock. So even if they make a loss on production, they're willing to do it. This model also allows us to think about who buys and who sells data. So now we get to this, remember that parameter ZI. I said it wasn't essential, but it was kind of interesting to think about some firms who are really good at turning transactions into data, the Amazons, and some firms that are really bad at turning transactions into data, like the corner drugstore. So let's Think about efficient data producers. Those are the ones with the high ZI and not so efficient ones. It turns out that in many instances, efficient data producers don't produce high quality products. They don't actually use their data. And the reason here is kind of like gains to specialization, sort of like what happens in trade when country A is good at producing apples and B has a comparative advantage in bananas. Well, here, this firm has a comparative advantage in acquiring uh, data. 
And so they specialize in that. And the other firm is no better at producing goods, but it has a comparative advantage in producing goods. And so the firms the, that are less good at producing data may actually end up accumulating more data. So the omega L of the firm that's no good, that's their knowledge stock could actually be bigger than the stock of knowledge of the firms that are really good at producing data. Because those firms that are good at producing data sell all of their data, or maybe it's data services to firms that will specialize in using it to produce high quality goods. So we can think about how this changes with market concentration. So as market concentration means here that there are fewer efficient data producers. So like the max market concentration is one firm that's really good at turning its transactions into lots of data. And low market concentration will mean everybody's pretty good at this and equally good at this. So as we get more data market concentration, we get a larger knowledge gap. We get more unequal distributions of data throughout the firms. We get firms that are data inefficient, getting most of their profit from selling goods and not so much profit from, uh, from, from data, that's down here, and firms that are very data efficient, getting less and less of their profits from selling goods, but getting more of their profits from selling data. So we're seeing this divergence between the strategies of these two firms as we get more data, con more market concentration. And this looks something like emergence of data platforms, right? Firms that are really good at acquiring data and selling it to others and don't really do much in the way of producing new goods. Okay, so let me conclude. There was a lot going on here. There were some really simple assumptions. Data raises productivity or it raises the quality of the good. It raises the value we get out of unit of good and it's not perfectly rival, right? So it shared some features of technology but it wasn't the same as technology. It's used for forecasting. You could accumulate it. You could generate it by doing these transactions. Big data, we said, is, is information used for forecasting. That's, that's what we mean by data in this model. And there are admittedly other uses of data, but we're focusing on that one, and it's pretty common. The results are you get diminishing returns in the long run because, well, we can't really get to perfect forecasts as long as there's something unlearnable in the world. And even if we did get to perfect forecasts, they're probably not going to get us in being able to forecast tomorrow perfectly is unlikely to generate infinite real value. So that implies diminishing returns. But in the short run, we could have lots of increasing returns and things that look like poverty traps with data. Um, and that happens when knowledge is low. And the returns to specialization. So firms that are good at data collection tend to specialize in collecting and distributing and selling that data. And they get most of their profits from doing that. And the other firms who are not so good at data production buy the data and use it for producing high quality goods. So we get a, a theory of sort of emergence of data platforms. And lastly, this is really more of a tool than, I don't think the results that we're telling you are something that will surprise you about the world. It's really trying to show you that this tool generates realistic features of the world so that that makes it a useful tool. So what would you use this tool for? You could think of it as, you know, you could think of data-driven innovation and you could move towards endogenous growth. You could think about data pricing theory, right? One of the big issues we're wrestling with is how should we value these firms for whom their main asset is a data stock. How much should they be willing to pay for more data? You could use it to think about, you know, different data has different degrees of relevance. We, we sort of wrote down a model where one firm could just sell its data to another firm and it's equally as good as if they produce the data themselves. But maybe these firms are imperfectly correlated, right? And so data from another firm is not quite as good as my own um, because, well, you know, it was about their experience and they're a little different from me, right? You could build that in by thinking about covariance between these firms' datas. And finally, you could use this to think about firm dynamics with some entry and some exit and some imperfect competition. And data could be, you know, what's going on in, in, in changing the degree of competition between firms in the economy. So I'll stop there. Thanks a lot, Laura. Um, Ezra, would you mind sharing your slides? Uh, Laura, you have to unshare, yes. Perfect. Okay, so the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thanks to uh, Mariam and, and Laura for uh, inviting me to discuss this paper. And uh, it, was a, it was a fun paper to, uh, to read and, and go through and think about uh, uh, the way that big data can be uh, introduced in the models I'm, I'm, I'm used to thinking about. Um, so 
just to give you a quick uh, overview. So I mean, the paper is a, that's one that has a nice uh, basic model that's easy to work with and it's easy to generalize in a bunch of different directions. Uh, and it goes through um, a bunch of different uh, applications and extensions of that basic model and helps you think about things like this, the, this data feedback loop uh, that have been uh, thought of in literature, things like the role of, of scale in, in helping uh, uh, and how that interacts with data, uh, the market for data and how uh, spillovers coming from collecting data can affect uh, one firm uh, can can affect uh, the um, the output of uh, or the profitability of another firm. Uh, why individual firms might be specialized in data collection uh, versus and things like why uh, uh, what happens when some firms have a comparative advantage in in producing data uh, or collecting data um, or producing whereas other ones have uh, uh, um, a comparative advantage in in using either collecting or processing data. And I think it, it kind of the, the way I view this paper is kind of lays out an agenda to study a bunch of uh, issues related to big data uh, and from dynamics and 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 growth. Um, so I, I think the the the, I, the frame the frame up in the paper is, is a little bit uh, a little bit different than, than the way Laura started the, talking about the paper. So I, I think it's uh, when I, when I first read the paper, it's easy to for me to, at least to come away thinking the question is like what what's new about big data? Is it is something that's new, new conceptually? And I, I don't think that's the kind of question where it, it, you, one can give an, a clear definitive answer. I don't think it's a very well, well defined question. Uh, but I think that the, instead the kind of view this as uh, the frame paper is a way to like, uh, just like a like call to arms to go out and measure things and see how they uh, see what, what, what differences they, they cause. And in that spirit, I think the, the paper, uh, that my comments be sort of geared toward uh, focusing a bit more on Laying out the, uh, a roadmap for future empirical work to go out and take take these models and 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 uh, test some of the um, so the predictions that, that come out of them. Um, so just talk about so a little bit about why I think it's uh, not a very well defined question to think about the relationship between data and other concepts that we are used to studying. So um, there are a bunch of different features of data that have clear analogs uh, with ideas or technology or productivity. There's all different words that get that get used. So, so first, uh, uh, ideas are a type of data. So if you have a, in, in the precise sense that Laura, Laura said, a, a uh, data is as prediction technologies, we think of ideas as often as a recipe uh, to produce output. You, another way to say that is a prediction about what certain inputs will produce if you follow the recipe. Well, um, so in some sense, the ideas are literally a, a type of, of, of data. Um, they, you can think of that as joint output of, of in the, uh, ideas as, um, um, all right, so in data, you, you can, when you produce the data as a byproduct, also learning by doing as a byproduct as well, as this is talked about in the, in the paper. Um, there are these feedback loops and returns to scale that come up in these learning by doing models. Um, there's this partial non rivalry which is, of course, um, a, a, a feature of ideas. We can think about uh, uh, with, with um, ideas can be sold or, or to other firms, just like data can be sold to other firms. And we see that in the form of licensing. Um, firms are willing to produce uh, data at a loss in the same way that firms might be able to uh, produce at a loss to learn what, what they're doing uh, and to improve their, their technology or their organizational capital to improve their, 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 their technology over time. Um, firms, uh, there are some firms that focus on data production, just like there are some firms that focus on R&D more than uh, actual physical goods production. Um, there are, uh, I guess one feature of the, uh, the paper that the, uh, was emphasized with is this eventual diminishing returns to data. Um, some people argue in the growth literature that there's also diminishing returns to R, R and D. Um, uh, both of these, it's, it's kind of, I say it's controversial about whether the, these are uh, features of the real world, but uh, there are analogs there as well. Uh, even the, the, the term stock of knowledge is also a term that is often used in the when we're talking about ideas and growth. People will talk about the uh, accumulated R&D. So there are all these, there are these uh, analogs of different thing. And the problem in asking the question, are these really the same thing? Is that there are just so many forms of both ideas and of data that's just not a very well-defined question. I don't know what a good answer to that would be. Um, like with ideas, we can think about even just the basic growth model, like Romer, Grossman, Helpman, Aguil and Howard, Cord they all have different formulations of what an idea is what technology is. They're all useful. They all ring true of the real world, but they're different and they have different suggestions about what you should go out to in order to measure uh, progress. And in the same way, uh, big data, there are lots of different ways to think about what big data is and what to do. Um, as you can think about the data themselves, the algorithms, the equipment that goes along with them, all these different uh, things. And each are a bit different. 
And uh, there's just not a very concrete question at this uh, high level of abstraction. What are these the same thing or different than what's been done before? Um, so my view is that in, in, instead of thinking about whether or not these are the same thing, it's useful to think about uh, how we can think concretely about big data as this paper does to try to answer some important questions that we care about. Um, so the, before I talk about that, let me say that there are some issues that are very specific to big data and, and that clearly don't apply to ideas that are not the focus of this paper. Um, there are studies of things like uh, privacy issues, uh, whether consumers uh, don't like whether firms have their data for, uh, or uh, whether big data allows more better price discrimination or something like that. Um, so th those, those are, of course, uh, specific to big data, but not, not uh, uh, what's talked about in this paper. There are also specific legal regimes that uh, might apply differently to ideas versus data. So for ideas, you can think about patent regimes or licensing regimes that are very specific to ideas, whereas for data, the specific legal regimes are who has property rights over, uh, over data or how long can it be kept? Those are specific questions that are you can ask about big data that maybe don't apply to ideas. Again, these, so there are some concrete things, but that's not um, uh, in this paper. So what I want to try to talk about is uh, what I think the role of uh, the kind of forces that, that Mariam and Laura were, were, are, were focusing on and uh, how they can help us uh, with growth. So there are all kinds of things in the economy that can improve a firm's performance, um, uh, their, their productivity, their quality, their profitability uh, that we've been talking about in the, in the growth literature and the firm dynamics literature as well. Um, and there are some really big questions that are um, that in, in, in growth that are not so easy to answer. So things like what, what precisely are the mechanisms that generate increasing returns to scale? And how strong are increasing returns to scale? Uh, are increasing returns to scale, if they're there, are they external or internal to the firm? Who's internalizing what? What are the spillovers? Um, is there scope for policy to improve outcomes? And if so, which policy should we implement to try to get to better outcomes? Um, and it's one reason why it's so hard to get a handle on these, these big questions is that, again, these sources of productivity growth can take so many forms, it's hard to know what, what can deliver a big answer to these big questions. Uh, and, but in, instead, it's, I think it's really useful to focus on uh, very concrete sources of productivity growth. Uh, and in this case, that source is the use of, of big data. Um, and, and when doing that, you can get to more concrete answers to these uh, in, important questions. So, so some of the questions are like, you know, how strong is this data feedback loop, right? How, how, how much has big data changed firms returns to scale? Um, uh, does big data change our, the way we think about antitrust uh, and antitrust enforcement? Um, so for all these questions, the, the, when you're thinking about big data in particular, what that suggests is that there are certain types of measurements that we need to take in order to answer those particular questions. So whether or not they're, they're, they're conceptually similar to ideas, the measurements you want to take to answer these particular questions uh, are specific to big data. And you want to think about big data in order to do that. And so being concrete about what big data is doing is makes it easier to uh, map uh, model to an empirical context. I shouldn't use, I shouldn't say map model to data, um, but map model to an empirical context. Um, so uh, I got to kind of go through an, an example of that. So when thinking about uh, data and scale, so uh, big data, of course, uh, uh, as, as, as many people have emphasized, uh, may give an advantage to large firms uh, and for several reasons, right? So uh, as in the paper, large firms have more transactions to observe, to observe, right? You just interact with more people and uh, you can, that, that just provide, if, if the uh, data is, is transactions, you just have more, more of it if, you, if you're very large. Um, it also, uh, sort, of a, sort of a corollary of that is that when you have more data, you have better opportunities to experiment um, so right, so right, Amazon wants to, you know, change where they put their buy now button button and see what that does to uh, consumers' behavior. Um, so if you have a very large scale, you can just try that out on some of your customers, and if you have a big scale, you can get a really precise answer to what that does very quickly. A small store can do a similar experiment, but they just can't um, uh, generate the same. It might take a, a long time to to get a precise answer to what that change did to your. Um, to, to consumer behavior. Um, and uh, again, this is this is prediction, right? This is, we, we wanna predict what happens. Uh, experimentation and prediction are very related, right? You do something different, you wanna see what doing, you wanna predict what doing something different will, will do. Um, and so large can help you uh, uh, experiment better. Um, 
larger firms also find it worthwhile to make these complementary investments into uh, into experimenting and 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 learning and and using using data, right? So, for example, like Netflix has this has this nice interface where they allow their um, uh, the, the, their workers to uh, experiment very easily, right? So they they set it up so you just you want to experiment, you just you do it, you get an answer. It's very quick, and very easy. You don't have to work very hard, and that's uh, something they they worked very hard to do. A large firm has an incentive to uh, to do that kind of thing because um, they are going to be doing potentially a lot of experimenting. And further, large firms have ex incentives to pay these fixed costs to experiment, to do experiments, uh, even if they will uh, increase the productivity only by a little bit, right? Because uh, if there's a fixed cost to do an experiment and you can increase uh, your profit by just a little bit, you know, that, that's still worthwhile to, to Google, might not be worthwhile to a very a, a small, a small store. Um, and so for all these reasons, uh, these big data and stuff is, is useful for, for to big firms. And there's a this big question of uh, what what does big data do to uh, from dynamics concentration, uh, right? This is just a, a picture I stole from um, uh, the the superstar firms paper, the rise of the superstar firms paper. Concentrations rising uh, everywhere. That's all you need to take away from this picture. Um, and the question is, uh, is big data responsible for that? And in one sense, it's, it's certainly plausible. Uh, another sense, it's not so obvious that these forces are new, right? So larger firms always had more incentive to experiment. They always had an easier time experimenting, and they could also always hire experts or consultants to get data the old-fashioned way. You know, you, you you go out and look at what's going on. It's not as as it's not big data, but it's still data. Um, is is big big data will help you do this better, right? It's it's easier to store data. Uh, it's less costly to analyze data. Um, and that can, of course, make your analysis better and make you do, make predictions better, um, right? So if you introduce, McDonald's introduces a new item, they can always they could have see how that they want to see how that item sells across their stores. Now they can estimate better, you know, with get more refined uh, predictions about how uh, that an item will sell. You know, which demographic groups might buy it better or or, or whatnot. Um, so big data certainly can do this better, um, but but does it explain the rise of superstar firms? That, that these are the, the big questions we're answer, we're interested in answering. So this is I mean, these ideas have been put forward by uh, some of uh, Mariam and Laura's earlier work, uh, and there's some uh, other recent empirical work has 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 shown that indeed it looks like digital capital is very concentrated in, in the large firms, which makes us uh, suspect that, uh, that or at least gives us a reason to think that. Um, uh, this big data is is related to the rise of superstar firms, um, but again, there's a lot more to know. Uh, I think mean, these are important for all kinds of policy questions, right? So, um, are the antitrust issues different now that big data is here than they, than they used to be, right? Uh, right. So we we know that the um, these types of data feedback loops can create entry barriers, right? We know this from the learning by doing uh, literature uh, for that we've we've known for decades. And the, but the question is. Uh, how important are they? How uh, right? So how strong are these internal or external increasing returns from from big data? Um, how strong is the data feedback loop? Um, is it the same for different types of data? You know, do different da da different types of data complement each other in doing this? Um, how large are the barriers for entry um, caused by by big data? Uh, and if the eventual uh, you know if, if there are diminishing returns to scale to how much um, uh, big data? affects your productivity growth, when do they diminish? At what scale do, they, do those diminishing returns uh, kick in? And, and uh, so these are all questions that, again, they're hard to answer in general, but with uh, if you focus specifically on, on data, there's some hope of getting some concrete answers to sort of the more narrow versions of these, these questions and ask how they, uh, the answers to these questions have, have changed over the last couple of decades. Um, are there, and again, if there are there, uh, one part of the role of the theory is to ask, you know, what are the auxiliary predictions we might expect that would give us confidence in our estimates of these, like this relationship between uh, increasing returns to scale and uh, uh, and uh, the rise of big data. And so I think the example that Laura, Laura gave at the end with, uh, we're thinking about the relationship between concentration and the data gifts is a very nice example of some, some an extra prediction you might look at um, to uh, to think about, you know, is, it, is this mechanism Getting more important or or not so much. Those are different measurements we can take uh, to do that. Um, there are specific policy questions that are. are I'm sorry, are, Ezra, you have five minutes. Okay, okay. Um, it, about about data itself that that you want a model of, of data to think about and not just a generic model of ideas to think about. Um, so in a very specific sense, uh, it 
if, if we can sort of link, legally distinguish between sort of data and other types of uh, intangible capital, we can make policy that's specifically geared toward data. So the, policy, the kinds of policies I was talking about before are just generic policies talking about scale or competition or whatnot. Um, and those, those may have to change due to the presence of big data. Uh, that's an open question. But again, data um, can lead to specific uh, policies with respect to data. Like, like we can, in principle, uh, subsidize uh, or tax data collection. Um, should we do that? Uh, should we subsidize sharing of data? Um, th that you know, might help in that it might remove some duplication efforts. There might be some uh, other issues in that. You, you have to think about how well the market for data is functioning. Um, and should we do this differently for different types of data? Um, you know, so with, with ideas, patents give this kind of temporary monopoly right to the originator. Um, in, uh, but in doing that, they, the reason we, we allow for this is that uh, the originator has to disclose the insight, right? They have to uh, you know, write down uh, the invention and other people can eventually copy it more, more easily. Uh, is there some analog with big data where uh, you know, we want to incentivize people, uh, firms to create uh, data to improve their, their quality? Do we want to eventually have some, can we find some kind of institution to, to incentivize them to share the data so that other people can improve their quality uh, as well? Um, so all kinds of uh, questions that are specific to, to, to data. All right, let me talk very, very briefly about uh, one, one prediction, uh, which uh, Laura talked about, which, uh, which is this, this, this prediction that uh, there was a zero long run growth. Um, and again, in, in the model, the data was modeled as a, 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 or the stock of knowledge of a firm was modeled as the uh, precision of the posterior beliefs about what the right action to take was, um, right? The forecast area that a firm would have about what the right option uh, to, to choose was um, uh, just normal with the variance is the inverse of the precision. And the paper, right, the, the, as, as Laura mentioned, uh, um, productivity is this, uh, um, of a firm was given by this, uh, sort of this maximal productivity minus the squared of the square of the forecast area. And, and again, as, as Laura said, that, that leads to this strong prediction uh, that is kind of hardwired that you get, um, there's some cap on how high uh, firms productivity or firms quality uh, might be. Uh, the, the only point I want to make here uh, is that it's very easy to think about other um, uh, formulations of this that uh, to me are very plausible that don't have this 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 property. Um, so you see if, if you make the the way a forecast enters uh, your your um, your quality multiplicative instead of additive, uh, you end up with uh, so, something where you, where your quality can be unbounded um, or there's no there's no bound to how high your, your quality can be. Um, uh, as your forecast error, as your as your precision goes to zero, your uh, you know that this is bound. So I, I mean, this this uh, is one example of what Laura talked about is a particular model where a perfect forecast would give you infinite quality. Um, and so the way you would think about it is something like a, uh, firms can get better and better forecasts, and that will can uh, improve their um, their their quality without bound. Is this more plausible, less plausible than the formulation in the paper? I, I don't know. To me, there, I, I don't see a, a strong ex ante reason to prefer one over over the other. Um, maybe it's in in the eye of the beholder. I don't think it's in the end. I don't think it's a philosophical question. It's more of an empirical question of like what's when you think about what's the right functional forms for how um, you know how strong are the diminishing returns or whether these these kick in. That that seems like something that we can go out and try to try to measure. Um, a, a different formulation of this idea of whether whether or not. Uh, Better predictions can uh, where there's a bound on how how good the predictions can be, right? So most people accept that there's no bound on productivity or on on overall quality. So a lot of our standard growth models have uh, uh, you know quality can take any any uh, a real number, um, or there's no bound on the quality that with which a good can be produced. And if you have you know again as I said in the beginning, you can think about uh, um, ideas or as Prediction technologies, if prediction of like you have a, a, a particular recipe, what's the if you uh, a prediction, uh, an idea is a prediction of what is the quality that will result from using that that recipe. And if you the more uh, the more of those ideas you know about, the better your predictions are about what which uh, uh, recipe you should use uh, or what what the which recipe you, you should use. Um, again, so um, 
with improved data, you can refine your uh, choices. You can get better and better choices of which which of these you know uh, bandits uh, should be uh, bandit levers should be pulled, uh, and that can lead to higher and higher output over time. So I mean, this is not uh, super new, but the prediction can uh, is a different formulation of why prediction might uh, uh, lead to uh, unbounded increases in in quality. Um, so anyway, uh, let me uh, just stop there. As it's very uh, a stimulating paper uh, it gave us a lot to think about about how um, we can introduce big data into our models and how uh, it might uh, we might think about the um, the way uh, big data in particular might change some of the um, uh, quantitative uh, qu change quantitatively some of the uh, mechanisms that we care about for growth and firm dynamics uh, and it'd be great uh, the the one the one suggestion I have is just to give a little bit more guidance about the Kind of the there, there's some key elasticities in this in this model like like how strong are these is this data feedback loop and thinking about you know just how how, how can empirical work uh, start thinking about going about estimating these key elasticities that will say how important some of these issues are and how uh, how much big data changes our, our view on these on these big questions for growth. And thanks. Um, thanks so much, Ezra, uh, for the great discussion. And I also personally thank you as a, one of the co-authors. So thank you for all the great comments. So I would like to remind everybody that if you have questions, please use the Q&A option, or also you can raise your hand. And while we collect questions, uh, Laura, would you like to take a couple of uh, minutes, like one or two minutes, to respond to uh, Ezra's comments briefly? Absolutely. Thank you, Ezra. That was an incredibly thoughtful discussion. Um, we really appreciate all the effort you went put into that. Um, so uh, let me start with um, the model's not entirely new. Uh, guilty is charged. Um, you know, we borrowed lots of ideas from various places, uh, from you know, learning by doing and technology and so forth. I, I think recombining features of other similar concepts is part of what innovation is. Um, I think on the question of privacy and ownership. Um, I, I agree, these are really important and fascinating aspects of data. I would refer you to Chad Jones and Chris Tenetti's paper on the topic. It's one of my favorite papers in the last few years. They took up that, so we headed off in a, in a different direction, but um, you know, that's the, there's nothing wrong with exploring that. Um, about diminishing returns, I'll say that Pat Bajari, the lead economist at Amazon, has a paper with uh, Victor Chernozukov, I think Ali Hortaksu and another co-author whose name I'm forgetting, uh, where they do document that there are diminishing returns to additional data at very high levels of data, which Amazon has, in particular because there are these unpredictable shocks, right? And no, much how, no matter how much data they have, when everybody switches from light and blue shirt to purple shirt, sometimes we don't see that coming. And that's kind of you know, going on in this model as well. And then the rest, I, I agree completely. I, I just think that what you're outlining is an agenda and it's agenda that I love and I love your impatience with like, let's get to work on it. This is awesome. Um, but I think it's really useful to start with just doing theory. And you know, one reason is I don't think it's possible to put everything you've described in one paper, right? Nobody would want to referee it. It'd be 100, 200 pages long. Um, and I think also, you know, we shouldn't measure first. Um, we should focus on, uh, you know, we need to have frameworks. And we should first look at the framework and ask the question, is this a useful framework? Does it, does it make sense? Does it have features we think are important? And then once we have a framework we make sense and we sort of agreed on and you know you get that, that somewhere through the refereeing or your publication process, then measure away, right? But, but trying to do everything at once, I think partly it would divert the attention to some particular results that are being measured rather than here's a tool and we could take it in a lot of different ways, we could measure growth. We could measure, you know, firm superstars. We could measure data feedback. We could measure, you know, this and, and that, and all kinds of directions one one might extend it in. I don't want to be pinned down to one because I see this as more of a general purpose technology rather than an innovation in any one of these particular directions. So I want to I want to defend doing simple theory, um, you know, for for its own merits, but absolutely agree with you that uh, that, you know, we should as a whole as a community, I would encourage everybody to jump in and and, you know, help find ways to measure this because I think it's a, a, you know, a promising direction forward. Um, OK, so there are a couple of questions and I think we're going to run out of time before we get to all of them. But let me ask the first one, Zaki Lee. Uh, he had a question on the Q&A. So Zaki, uh, please go ahead with your uh, question. You should be unmuted. Okay. 
Uh, thank you very much. It's a very interesting paper. I just uh, wondering, like, uh, how to can you comment on the similarity and uh, difference between your paper and the learning by doing and also the learning curve literature? Okay, thank you very much. Great, uh, good question. Um, so one of the differences is learning by doing. We usually think of that as knowledge that's embodied in the human capital of a particular worker. Right, the longer I do this job, the more I know. And I can't take a piece of my brain and sort of unplug it and sell it to you, right? And so, but with data, we can do this. Data is owned, it is not embodied in someone's brain. It is something that's owned by a firm and the firm can take it and sell it to someone else. And that's important for what's, what's going on here because you know the fact that a firm could buy data can change the trajectory of that firm relative to if you know the firm had to accumulate it in the human capital of the workers themselves. But what it has in common is that the more you do, the more you learn, right? And so, you know, this is a case where we're taking some features that look like learning by doing, but then merging with them with some features that are specific to data. And, and non-rivalry, I'm pretty sure your brain and what you know is rival, right? You can't, um, you know, you can't just copy that bit of your hard drive costlessly. Now, we do pass human capital on to others. It's called teaching, and but it's pretty costly, right? As, as most of us who do it regularly know, um, it's, it's not a free process. So, um, you know, some similarities and some differences. Um. All right, uh, so given that we are up, out of our official time, we're gonna uh, now uh, change the format to the, uh, to the unofficial Q&A. But uh, before that, let me just uh, briefly mention uh, that uh, we are very, very happy uh, to have you all next week. And we hope that you enjoyed the session today. And next month, we're going to have uh, Wei Jong and uh, Francisco da Conto discussing the art and AI of uh, stock analysis. And now we're going to stop the recording and uh, we are really hope that you can stay with us for a few more minutes and join our informal post seminar discussion that hopefully the remaining questions uh, will be posed and uh, you should ask all your follow-up questions. Now we're going to upgrade all the remaining participants to the panelist status so that we can uh, all see each other uh, freely and have a nice chat.